Welcome to Connecting Diasporic Literature. I am your host, Alice Maria James, and I'm here with the president of Centenary University, Dr. Dale Caldwell. Uh, Dr. Caldwell, I would love to share your whole bio with everybody, but you know we can't do that. But I would, would love for you to share about Centenary University and your vision as far as the Black uh, Halls of Fame. Well, well, thank you very much. Good, good evening. Good evening, everyone. It, it is an honor to have these legendary women here uh, with us. We're going we're gonna to learn a lot and be inspired today. So uh, um, first, I, I guess I'll say, even before I was at Centenary, I founded the Black Authors Hall of Fame and, and really wanted some dynamic leader, a, a woman of vision and power. And so, so Alice James was, uh, was selected and she's uh, just exceeded, exceeded the expectations. And I started the Black Authors, the Black Inventors, the Black Tennis and the Black Educators Halls of Fame to really permanently record history that has been overlooked. And so that's really the, 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 the reason that these Halls of Fame, we, we don't remember award ceremonies, but we remember Halls of Fame. So uh, you are all legends until that. Centenary University is a 157-year-old university uh, here in Hackettstown, New Jersey, the northwest corner of New Jersey. I'm the first African-American president, and actually I'm here in the president's house. Um, and we're really trying to, to, to really have intercultural competence as one of our, our main focus areas, to really bring the world together, to introduce new, new cultures and perspectives that other people don't know, and, and to create a unified world around diversity. So, so that's who we are. Um, we are welcome to have students apply. We have graduate programs. We have certificate programs. So we're just excited to be part of this. And Susan Van Alsten, our director of the library, is one of the most entrepreneurial leaders of the library. And really, it's with her and, and Alice who put this whole program together. So with that, Alice, I'll turn it back to you. I'm going to allow our skit to come forth. Okay. So this is a conversation between Patwa Patsy and Speaky Spokey. I'm Patwa Patsy. <laughs> and I'm Speaky Spokey. <laughs> Wagwan. Are you addressing me? Surely you mean how do you do? Eh eh. Then it's why you so speaky spokey. There is a great reason we have to translate for some audience members. But Patwa is free language. It is, if it's good enough for Miss Lou, then it's good enough for everybody. Well, that's really very true. Dr. Louise Bennett Covelli's seminal pedagogy and scholarship elevated Jamaican culture. You mean, say, Miss Lou, bring me culture to the world with the patwa. But I know everybody know it. Uh, quite so. That is why we're gathered here today, to amplify Caribbean literary culture. We want to welcome a new generation. Yes, it's nice to see how on a send call all of the young people them to gather around to hear the story and the poem them. Indeed, this Black History Month is a chance for more of us to understand and acknowledge the close historical ties between the U.S. and the Caribbean. From the abolition of slavery, through the Harlem Renaissance, to the 21st century. For example, Alexander Hamilton, who was born in Nevis, was a significant figure in the establishment and governance of the United States. Jamaica's Marcus Garvey advanced the civil rights movement during Jim Crow. Barbadian Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm ran for the presidency of the U.S., and Jamaica's Louise Bennett Covelli took the baton, spreading Jamaican language and culture in the United States and further afield. Oh, Lord. Miss Peaky Spooky, 
Well, I don't have anything else to say. You blow the words <laughs> right out of my head. You take over and make the other announcements, my dear, because they can understand you better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, coming up next, um, we're going to have Dr. Opal Tama Adisa, who will be giving us a presentation on nation language, Jamaica's nation language. Take it away, Professor. Thank you. Oh, go on. <laughs> you know, uh, thanks to President Obama, uh, everyone who did not know what that means now know oh, go on. It's how we say it in Jamaica. How are you? What's up? You know, we're glad to hear your story. And so I'm speaking about nation language, but actually I'm actually doing a precursor. So the title of my piece is called A Serious Scholar on Jamaica Nation Language, Louise Bennett, a.k.a. Miss Lou. And I feel it's important to do that because whereas many people know about Louise Bennett, many people do not know about her scholarship. So I beg your indulgence uh, for me to share this information with you. And I want to start with a quote that was done by Robert Verity in 1961 in referring to Louise Bennett's work. And Verity says, her work has constituted an invaluable contribution to the discovery and the development of an indigenous culture. And her verses are valid social documents reflecting the way we think and feel and live. And as you all know, language is the cosmology of a people. It speaks to the way we feel, the way we think, um, the way we react, and which is why during enslavement, the language, the African language was denied, um, and, but we retained it. And so what we call patwa, which is a term that I think should be banished, but nation language is really a combination, like most languages are a combination of twi, T-W-I, from Ghana, because that was a dominant group that came to Jamaica, um, English, um, and it has some Spanish words and some uh, Taino words, because the Tainas were here and gave us things like guava, guayaba, and things like that. So, but nation language, like any language, is the mixture of all of those that comes to represent our very ethos. But a little bit on Miss Lou. Louis Bennett has long been a household name, not only in Jamaica, but throughout the Caribbean, where her poetry is taught as well as in England and other North American regions. However, pe many people know very little about Miss Lou, or rather they know very little about Louise Bennett, who is a scholar. It's way past time that we set the record straight and understand that Louise Bennett's entire career, whether it is her pivotal role in pantomime as an actress, writer, and director, or her role as a folklorist collecting stories, recording dances, documenting Jamaican proverbs, riddles, and other sayings throughout Jamaica as a cultural worker, her, or her formative role as the host as well as the content provider for the only Jamaican TV show for children on Jamaican culture, Ring Ding, that has ever been produced. Louise Bennett dedicated her entire life um, as a cultural activist and a cultural commentator to the people and the culture of Jamaica. And I want to underscore that, that this was a life of of lifelong contribution and a conscious contribution on Louise Bennett's part. It is important that people understand and know that Louise Bennett was a scholar. It was her scholarship that informed her work. Neglected by the academy and the educators, it, that informed her work. Um, it was not until 1963 when the literary critic and professor at the University of the West Indies, Mona Mervyn Morris, wrote an insightful piece examining the work of Louise Bennett entitled Reading Miss Lou Seriously. This is really the first important essay and scholarship about Louise Bennett's poetry. Yet despite this, Louise Bennett's work was largely ignored by the Academy and her poetry was relegated as dialect poetry, a term that trivialized her craft and content. 
And even though Miss Lou's work is celebrated widely now in Jamaica and is often featured in the festival competitions, her work is still limited to the dialect category. And oftentimes the way the children are taught to say her poem, it is as if it can only be loud and crass and one dimensional. This has to change because her work can be and should be read on multiple levels. Allow me to pause here and give you some background about Louise Bennett's education and then go into the use of nation language and what I believe was her mission. Louise Bennett attended Excelsior High School, a very important high school during that era and still is, and she graduated in 1942. This was before independence, before decolonization. It was there that Louise first recognized and was recognized for using dialect poetry. And in fact, Eric Coveley, whom she married 12 years later, who became her husband, was an entertainer and a promoter of Jamaican theater, saw Miss Lou perform, saw Louise Bennett perform, and asked her mother to have her perform at his Christmas show that he curated, and that was her first paying gig. After graduating from Excelsior in 1943, Miss Lou enrolled at Friends College in Highgate, St. Mary, where she studied folklore. And this is an important marker that I want people to understand, that Miss Lou didn't just go about collecting folklore. She understood that the, the culture, the saying, the dance, the proverbs of Jamaicans were important, and she wanted the academic background so that she could collect and study these in a manner that was in keeping with the discipline and the scholarship. So she attended Friends College in Highgate, St. Mary, and studied folklore before she began to formally uh, collect in folklore. That was the same year her first poem was published in the Sunday Gleaner. Fast forward two years later in 1945, after being awarded a scholarship from the British Council, Louise Bennett was the first black student and the first Jamaican to study at the famous London Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. And Rather was rather prestigious then and is still considered an important institution that trains the best actors and actresses in the performing arts. And Louise Bennett studied there and excelled. And while there did performances throughout London, not only did she do performances throughout London, she also did a radio show on BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. Miss Lou and Jamaican Nation language are still using still being relegated to a certain class, which is why I no longer use the term Patwa, because Patwa, as defined, is a dialect of a particular region, especially one with low status. And unfortunately, some people still regard the Jamaican nation language as a low status language or a dialect. And oftentimes it's considered to be a jargon of informal speech used by a particular social group. And there are still those sp speaky spoky or stushy Jamaicans who refuse to speak the Jamaican language because they think it belongs to the working class or the rural people. And they don't want to be associated with it because after all, they are educated and know how to speak the Queen's English. Miss Lou was very well versed in speaking the Queen's English. Not only did she speak it, she understood it. However, she had a mission. And Miss Ru Miss Lou, and, and, and here's what we also need to know. All of Miss Lou's poems are written in the quatrain, which is a European form of poetry with a particular iambic metered rhyme, right? So she mastered a very important form of poetry that she revolutionized by using the Jamaican nation language. And in fact, it's a similar thing that um, her, her predecessor, 
uh, Claude McKay, the Jamaican poet who is consumed under the Harlem Renaissance, has done with the sonnet, and in particularly the sonnet, If We Must Die, that Winston Churchill used to uh, motivate the soldiers uh, during World War II, but that was not what uh, Claude McKay intended. Miss Lou, or Louise Bennett, used the quatrain form because she wanted to say that whatever form of poetry is used, it is appropriate through the Jamaican nation language. And what the Jamaican nation language does is to regionalize it and to expose and to highlight our feelings, our engagement with world and with, the, with life. So that was Miss Lou's mission, and she never veered from that mission in all of her years. She went on to not only write, but to always perform in the Jamaican nation language. And so Miss Lou was also um, the first person to nationalize pantomime, because before Miss Lou did pantomime, then uh, the pantomime was information and the content was European, Miss Lou nationalized pantomime and also introduced the use of Jamaican language in it. Um, I'm looking at time and I think I'm okay for time and I just want to do, uh, I want to point out, use two of Miss Lou's poems to illustrate um, her use of nation language and why that is important. So there are two poems from this collection. Um, that was edited by Mervyn Morris, Selected Poems, Louise Bennett, that came out in 1982. And the two poems I want to speak to very briefly are The Scholar and The Jamaican Woman. And these poems are very popular and have been done a lot by uh, school children and others. But I think, I believe firmly that the point is often missed in both of these poems. The first poem, shows us a mother who's coming to the school because her little boy is starting school for the first time and she wants the teacher to know about the child. Now, many times when people perform this poem, um, they perform it as if the mother is ignorant and doesn't know what, you know, is just there to kind of make sure that the, the, the teacher um, doesn't rough up her child. This is a very important poem. One is because it's entitled The Scholar, and this is a little boy going to school for the first time, so it could very well be the student. So that's the first signal Miss Lou gives us. And then the second signal that is embedded in the poem is that the mother is speaking to the teacher and she understands pedagogy because what she's telling the teacher is that this is my child and the more you know about him, the more effective you can be in teaching him. And so let me just read um, very quickly the, the, the first two stanzas of the poem. Good morning, teacher. How you do? My name is Sarah Poole. This is for my little boy, Michael, and me just bring him a school. So, you know, the poem begins in a matter of fact way. The mother has brought her child to school. But then she goes on to describe the school. And this is where I think Miss Lou is always so on point and, and is always teaching us. Because she says in the fifth stanza, not treat him rough, ya teacher. Him is a sickly child. As you touch him hard, him met nice. Some people say him wild. Now, you know, Jamaica's education system is all about roughing up children. At that time, uh, they would be children. And so the, the, in this poem, Miss Lou, in a, in a sense, is interrogating corporal punishment is in, in school. And the, and the parent is such an important conduit for that because she's saying, don't rough up my child. He will learn without being rough up. So Miss Lou is talking about this child who is a scholar or a potential scholar and is providing a pedagogical approach to how to teach the child. And, and the poem ends, now that you know in little ways and not fearing no fear, that anything will that anything will do him so and left him in your care. So, you know, she's saying to the teacher, I have given you all you need to know about how to teach him, and I'm no longer afraid. I know you will take care of him and that you will teach him what he needs to know so he becomes a scholar. 
Again, this is a very important poem that oftentimes is not done in the way that I think is important for it to be done. The next poem, which is one of my favorite poems, is called Jamaican Uman, not woman, O-M-A-N, because oftentimes we put H's where they're not and we take off words. And so Miss Lou starts this poem as Jamaican Uman Kunusa, is all them Jinalsa. Look how long them liberated and the man them never know. Now, there are two important things about this poem that one needs to understand. The word jinal and kunu. So Jamaica, uman kunu so. Kunu is that word that means it's, it's, it's cunning. It's uh, astute. It's um, observant. It's all of those things. But she's using the Jamaican word kunu to indicate that the Jamaican woman is smart and ahead of her time. And then she uses jinnal. Now, jinnal is a very interesting word in Jamaica. We often talk about a Nancy as a jinnal because he somehow gets his way by jipping people. But jinnal also in this content is, again, like kunu, is wise. In other words, you have to, what Miss Lou is saying, which is part of their Nancy persona, is that you have to be subterfuge in order to get ahead. And so the Jamaican woman has had to be subterfuge. She has had to pretend to be something else so that she can be the liberated woman that she is. And the poem goes on to say, and I love the second stanza, look how long Jamaican woman, mother, sister, wife, sweetheart, outer road and inner yard, the pan, a dominate her part. Again, so she's including all of the women, right? From nanny, from Maru, nanny, take her body, bounce, bullet, back pan man, to when nowadays girl pick me, turn spelling bee champion, right? So again, it's a historical poem. Maroon Nanny refers to our national heroine, the only female national heroine we had, Granny Nanny, who was a very successful and a very shrewd fighter for the Maroons. And then she brings it up today to the now spelling day champion. And then the poem ends, but the Kuni Jamaican woman ban her belly, bite her tongue, fetch water, put pot pan fire and just dig her tongue a grung. For woman lock the dungle heap, some rooted more than some. But as long as fowl a scratch dongly, woman luck must come. Little by little man start praise her. Day by day the praise go. <laughs> For him praise her, oh him praise her. So it's sweeter. For she wonder if him know. So the poem comes full circle and, uh, and, and, and really demonstrates that this is the strategy that the Jamaican woman has employed, had to employ in order to get ahead. So the Jamaican nation language is, is, is a plum of, of all of our folklores and our idioms that encapsulate who we are and how we go about progressing in life. And Miss Lou used it um, not only just to celebrate us and to document our legacy and our culture, but also to show that in our Jamaican nation language is the embodiment of our ethos. And so I now turn it over. Thank you. Thank you, Opa. And I just want to pick up on that um, linguistic aspect. Miss Lou is so amazing. She, um, when we, as, uh, as you pointed out, she writes on multiple levels. And I don't think there's any end to studying the, the, the various levels that Miss Lou is portraying. And I wanted to read a few verses of the candy seller in which Miss Lou exhibits the um, Jamaican facility with the language to castigate at the same in the same breath as it's complimenting. And the candy seller, she we hear her optimistic sales pitch. It's very charming. And then when she gets disappointed, then we hear the other side where we feel her deeply resentful response. So despite all of this hilarity, we have to empathize with the woman because her daily workplace stress is encompassing something we can all um, appreciate and empathize with. Stress followed by hope 
followed by despair, heavy stress. So let me read, read a few verses of Candy Seller for you. Candy lady, Candy mom, business bad nowadays. Lady with the pretty little boy, buy candy. Go on your ways. You're right to draw the picnic hand. Cook on him nose hole. Him yai them a tear out like him one. Hypnotize me candy bowl. Nice young man. Come here. What you want? Pin the cake? One glass? If you not buy nothing where you stop pop. Beg you move yourself, yeah, sir. Me no have button that you way. Give the lady pass for calm. Well, you don't join the Air Force. Them have plenty use for bomb. After a whole day of going and coming and maybe selling a little bit, our lady has had it. Me don't live up now, yeah, Dinah, she says to her other uh, friend on the corner. Lock a home, them lock up store, and everybody that go home, me na go sell much more. Me go cry out as me go along. Me might I get a break. Bye. Till later on, me gone. And that's my take on the candy seller. Opal's turn. We're still having a little bit of technical dis difficulty, but we're going <laughs> no, but to keep you it know, moving. These things always have some technical difficulties, and we just kind of roll with the with the punch. So the next part of my um, talk is about Miss Lou abroad in England, New York, and Canada, but continuing her mission of the Jamaica Nation language. And I want to again always, you know, we have to contextualize this. Now we're in 2024 and certain things we take for granted. Miss Lou was operating in a time before independence, in fact, 1942. So um, from 1962, so 20 years before independence. Here is this woman um, educated from working class, and very much aware of the social structure of Jamaica, but seeing, almost prophetic, seeing the value in who we are. And I want to underscore that, that from the very beginning, it's very clear that Miss Lou saw the value in who we are. And of course, you know, she was raised after her father died. She was raised primarily by her mother and her grandmother, both of whom lived with her until they died, right, even after she was married. And her grandmother was particularly influential in taking her to the market and in guiding her to look at and see the Jamaican people and to not feel that she was above them or below them or that they were above or below anyone else. So let's look at Miss Lou now. So Miss Lou goes to England on a scholarship to study at RADA. And in England, she gets a show on the BBC. And when I interviewed her, I had the pleasure of interviewing Miss Lou in 1987 and 1988, when I was uh, entered the doctoral program, I initially thought that I was going to do a biography of her. And when I interviewed her, she talked about how that BBC show came about, you know, and how she created something else off that show. So that show was for people in England and the Jamaican people who she says at the time were not going to take the kind of racial, racist discrimination stuff that was going on. And it was a way for them to keep in touch with people at home and to send greetings to Jamaicans at home. That was the genesis of the show. But it was also there that Miss Lou, I think, really got to understand her relationship with people and the rapport that she had and was able to create and therefore wanted to do more about Jamaica. And that's where she really started to, uh, or continued and um, pursue doing more poems for, uh, to share with Jamaicans in England as well as Jamaicans abroad. And so she came home 
And again, one of the things that many people uh, did not understand or do not know about Miss Lou is that um, Miss Lou really was uh, an academic in so many ways. And that one of the things that when she came home was that she worked with the uh, welfare uh, group and she uh, studied Jamaican culture that was part of her job. She went around um, and looked at collecting folklore all over Jamaica. So Miss Lou toured the 14 parishes of Jamaica and she spoke to the people and Easton Lee whom she trained and who took over when she left that job. One of the things he said to me in his interview is that Miss Lou always told him, you have to find out what the people need because if you don't know what they need, they're not going to share anything with you. And that was our folklore practice because those of us who have done folklore, we need to understand that it's a two-way street. And if you want valid information from the people, then you have to know what it is they need and what it is they want. And so Easton Lee would say that, you know, Miss Lou would always bring different things for different people in the rural areas where she visited because she knew they needed things and she could provide that and then they would be so much more forthcoming. In addition to that, uh, Miss Lou taught at the University of the West Indies uh, when it just started and she taught folklore and she did that for many, many years. Uh, so that's also an important part of her training that a lot of people don't understand that in, in part of what I'm emphasizing as her scholarship that needs to be underscored. And here are some other information that's important. So we know of Harry Belafonte who, who died recently, right? And we know of his famous hit song, Day O Light. And one of the things that most people or many people don't know that Miss Lou was the coach for Harry Belafonte. She uh, introduced him to Hill and Gully Rider. And certainly when I spoke to her, she talked about how both of them, um, you know, she practiced with him that song. Another thing that is important for us, us to understand is that um, Miss Lou yeah, uh, Cassidy, the first book on Jamaican nation language, which is what uh, Cassidy did, that he came to Miss Lou and Miss Lou also, again, provided him with a great deal of guidance and information about Jamaican nation language and what some of those terms meant. So uh, here again, we're seeing her connection. Miss Lou then went to New York um, after she uh, left Jamaica in, in the 50s um, and she was working in theater, she had the pleasure of meeting Maya Angelou and working with Maya Angelou. She also had the pleasure of meeting Langston Hughes and working with Langston Hughes. And interestingly enough, it was in New York in 1954 that she and Eric Covelli met up again. And of course, they got married um, there. So even in New York, Miss Lou had a profound influence in the theater she was doing and in sharing and dis disseminating Jamaican culture. Uh, and this was in the 50s. This was after Marcus Garvey, but Marcus Garvey and his legacy um, was very much still a part of that foundation. Claude McKay, who, who didn't do dialect poems when he was in Harlem, but his first collection, Ballads of a Policeman, the first collection he did was on out, was written in Jamaican nation language. And Miss Lou knew that, was aware of this kind of legacy and expanded on this legacy. She went back and forth to London for various performances throughout her lifetime and uh, other places in the world. And of course, then she ended up in Canada um, where because of her husband's illness and the, from there, although she had performed in Canada several times before, but in Canada, she really established a foundation um, and did a lot of work at continue to celebrate and showcase the Jamaican culture um, while she was there. So this is really the legacy of Louise Bennett. And one of the things I found out in uh, 2019, when I was celebrating her centennial, uh, 
was that Miss Lou is widely taught throughout the Caribbean and many other Caribbean islands, particularly the Anglophone Caribbean islands. Her poetry is taught to the children there. And so the children there know her poetry and love her poetry. And that is why for me, this book, 100 Voices for Miss Lou is so important. Um, it is a collection of tributes um, poetry, interviews, and essay. And for me, it's important, you know, I'm a Louise Bennett S. scholar, and it's important that people understand the full breadth of her work, understand uh, the scholarship of her work. And so this, the last section of this book, which is divided into five sections, are essays written by esteemed scholars, such as um, Carolyn Cooper and others, uh, writing on Miss Lou's work and the impact that it has had not only on Jamaican society but on the rest of the world. Miss Lou is also credited for dub poetry. And I dare say if Bob Marley was here, we're celebrating this movie, if Bob Marley was here, he would probably say that if it wasn't for Miss Lou, the songs he sung in the Jamaican nation language that he did, he would not have. And so when we talk about national heroine, yes, Bob Marley is famous and known throughout the globe, but we have to understand that he stands on the shoulder of Louise Bennett, who gave us all permission gave us permission to use and celebrate the Jamaican nation language. And as Muta Baruko, one of our famous dub poet, is so um, known for saying is that Miss Lou was the first dub poet. Without Miss Lou, there would not be dub poetry because Miss Lou gave the language its feet and others took it and walked with it. And so dub poetry, which is also an important aspect of Jamaica's development and celebration is a result of Miss Lou. So we need to understand all of the cultural avenues and streets that she paved for all of us who are here now celebrating and feeling proud to be Jamaican and feeling particularly proud for chat with chat. We talk, we talk, we write in a fluey language that express how we're feeling, we love and we're big heartedness, you know. And I want to end this presentation by reading an excerpt um, from the interview I did with Miss Lou in 1987. Um, and I say to Miss Lou, because this is also a perception or a, a, a element of Miss Lou that we see. I say, is the personal Miss Lou as jolly as the public Miss Lou? Where does the personal and the public merge? And this is Miss Lou's verbatim. I want somebody, man. That's what she said, I want somebody. So what she's saying is her public persona of jolliness and her private persona are the same. I could never have weathered all of the storms of my life if I didn't have joy and take kin teeth, keep a heartburn. So take kin teeth, keep a heartburn is a very common Jamaica saying. And what it means is that even though you are smiling, there is hurt. The smile is masking or soothing or helping to uh, move away the pain. So remember that phrase, take teeth, Kiba heartburn. I believe that we have the strength to overcome difficulties. Again, this is Miss Lou I'm quoting from. And a lot of it lies in our ability to laugh at certain things, to just bust out a laugh and blow off steam, right? And Miss Lou mastered that as a strategy to survive, as a strategy to promote her agenda of legitimizing and I use that word very carefully, legitimizing the Jamaican language. So that now I know of two universities where students uh, took the Jamaican nation language as a second language. And some of us here in Jamaica are still belly aching and saying we shouldn't, we should not teach that kind of language in the schools. And yet many of our children, it's the only language they speak 
is their mother's tongue. And in order for them to speak and become proficient in English, it has to be taught as a second language. So Miss Lou, me thank you, me thank you, me thank you. Me thank you for letting me know that me could chat, me chat. And me thank you for sharing our culture with the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a really good um, uh, view of much of the movement of Miss Lou's life and much of the, the influence that she wielded in so many different places and the pride with which we continue to read and study and share and speak and expand in our own use of the nation language. We are truly grateful to her. Thanks. I'm going to hand it over now to um, Faith, um, who will um, um, talk with us about a bill that Miss Lou um, mentioned in her poetry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, piggybacking on what uh, Professor Adisa says, Miss Lou is relevant at home and she's relevant abroad. Everything she tackles in Jamaica can fit somewhere else you just have to change the language just a little bit and i'm going to be talking about how she tackles domestic abuse but first let me say this so one of her important inventions in her literature was the auntie roche character auntie roche was the courageous wise woman archetype who carried the key message. She had a strong moral compass. Miss Lou could have done all that talking herself, but she knows her, she knows who she, she knows her audience. And so she put Auntie Roche in front to carry the message so people can hear it. In 1971, Miss Lou wrote Wife Beating Bill. Now well, here's how that happened. A radio show, called Man in the Street played an April Fool's prank on listeners by asking them about a fictitious wife beating assessment bill. I bet that wasn't funny to Miss Lou. So she has Auntie Roche deliver the key message. Domestic abusers deserve serious jail time. Of course, she was way ahead of her time because the law didn't pass until some 26 years later. So she, she did carry that fight. Now, before I read, here are some phrases that you should listen for. You're going to hear the word Budum. That's the name of one of the characters. Budum is also what it sounds like when you get a blow and it's exaggerated. Budum. Uh, you're going to hear the people them. Every time we need to do a plural, because we have conjugation in our language, mm -hmm. you're going to hear them. If it's the car, them, the people, them, the house, them, the ladies, them. Okay? Add an A to a helping verb. Him was a run. He was running. Him was a run. Him was a drink. Here's another plural, uno. Every time you want to say a, a, a second person plural, you say uno. Doppy. Who is a doppy? A doppy is a ghost. Friendly or unfriendly. Here's a proverb using the word doppy. Doppy no who fi frighten. Meaning a person doesn't bring a fight if he or she is guaranteed to lose that fight. To nyam is to eat. To nyam is to eat. Here is another proverb. Fowl run from hawk, but nyam cockroach. Meaning the chicken easily preys on the grub, the cockroach on the ground. But don't worry, the hawk is standing by. The hawk is a threat to the chicken. Okay, if you hear somebody say, Poop the kiss and hold up them hand on them head. It means Jesus 
take the wheel. To ball is to cry. <laughs> to ball out is to shout out, maybe in pain. And if you have a tizzy, it means you're in a tizzy, a very bad tizzy, and everybody knows what that is. Almost a nervous breakdown. Okay, now let's read for you Wife Beating Bill. Listen up. You hear the man in the street yesterday morning I asked the people what them think about the wife beating assessment bill. <laughs> I laugh so till water come up the eye when man in the street catch everybody, including my auntie Roche. Mm. When man in the street ask the people them if them think that the wife beating assessment bill should impose a prison sentence of no less than 12 months on the wife beating man them, all the women them holler, yes, for man too like for beat up woman and wife beating is too prevalent. Uh, when man in the street asks the people them if them don't think that a prison sentence is a bit harsh for the wife beater, all the women them say, no, send them go to jail. Although some people said 12 months was a little bit too much. But one woman holler, 12 months not enough. Prison the wife beating man them feel longer than that. Auntie Roche Hala. Prison them, yes. Lock up the advantage. Take of them. Lock up. <laughs> so when man in the street ask if them think that the proposed wife beating bill will cut down on the offense of wife beating, one man say that he don't approve of that bill at all, at all. It is barbaric, and there is no necessity to pass such a law. Hmm. People should find other means of dealing with such matter. Auntie Roche Hala, find other means? No! If them jail one or two or uno, plenty will stop woman maltreatment. For the most of the wife beating man is coward and them only tackle who them think weaker than them. Oh, dopey no who fi frighten. Fall run from hawk, but niam cockroach. So jail the man them, for jail is stronger than them. But the part where sweet me can't done is when the man in the street ask them, if them think any spouse should inflict more than three strokes upon them wife. One woman said that she would have settled for three strokes. My auntie wrote to get herself in a one temper and holler. Papa take the case. Second for three strokes. I it make a boy like Budum. Can take him wife Fuffy. So make beating stick all day long. Because poor Fuffy did start for settle for three strokes, then three times three strokes, then a hundred times three strokes. So till now Fuffy can't count the strokes them with boom a leg up an arm. Sick of a three strokes indeed. No man shouldn't be able to lick him wife at all. Without authority, lick him in a prison, jail him, lock him up, put him where that wife beating assessment bill going to be the popularest law. Hey, Auntie Roche work herself up into one tizzy that me have to shake her and ball out and tell her, say, go on your temper and calm yourself. Them don't got no wife beating assessment bill. It's prank them a play. A bay like a tom fool day. So you see here that Miss Lou decided to tackle this silent epidemic. And it's a global epidemic. Almost every country has statistics to show that 
domestic abuse is going on and we need to do make an effort to tackle it. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Great. All right, and with another uh, aspect of Miss Lou's work, we are going to welcome Andreen Bonner with the love letter. Thank you. That was fabulous, Faith. Oh my goodness. I, I heard it. I heard it. I heard it. And I know a lot of people heard what you had to say. Thank you so much. I'm going to do another, a different take on the culture um, in love letter. So you have the man we are beat, but on the other hand, you have the lover. In Louise Bennett Covelli's love letter, the poet vehemently refutes the pejorative notion that love and tenderness are absent in black communities, particularly among the less educated. I want you to listen closely to the speaker in the poem, an adult language learner who says in nation language, we're learning not to grand. So what me can spell, me withdraw. Translated, it means I do not have much education. But what I cannot spell in this letter, I will draw. I will paint you a picture of how I feel about you. You see, this bold assertion highlighting the speaker's limited literacy underscores the importance of finding alternative means to express profound emotions through humor and cultural familiarities. Miss Lou skillfully utilizes symbolisms and cultural attributes to infuse the poem with a, a lighthearted tone a signature of hers, challenging stereotypes and affirming the passion and tender expressions that run deep in the psyche of black communities. Love letter. <sighs> me darling love, me little dove, me dumpling, me gizada, me sweetie Sue, I goes for you like how flies goes for sugar. As I puts me pen to paper, and me pen nib start to fly, me remembrance remember the first day you catch me eye. You did just come off. A tram car. A bus was uh, to your right. A car sweeps past your left ears and your turn up stiff with fright. Your jaw drop, your mouth open, just like when jackass start yawn. My heart go boogoo boogoo boogoo. I mean, no one make me born. Do. Scar little letter. No laugh out of me, ah. Me learning not to brand. So what me can spell? Me withdraw. The thing in at the corner with the freckles is me heart. And the plate with the yam and saltfish mean that we can never part. You see how me draw the two face them? The look on one another? Well, <laughs> one is you and one is me. Take which one you rather. <laughs> it's not a cockroach for this. It's a finger with a ring. And it mean me want to marry you. This line is a piece of string. Take it. Put it round the wedding finger. Are your wedding hand? 
careful to get the right size and then give to this man. <laughs> the man is me. Now, sweet rice, keep swell till I see you next. Accept me young heart while I close with love and Banza X. Super. I love that poem and you just, you brought it to life. That's yeah, beautiful. Mm. All right. So, um, we are moving on to Opal again. Uh, Opal, you're going to share with us a little bit well, more. Well, actually, about... this, I don't know what's happened to Van Gill, but maybe this is a, an opportune moment for all of us to share. This was going to be a conversation about uh -huh. the impact of Miss Lou on us and the impact of Miss Lou on the world. And mm -hmm. Van Gill and I had, you know, talked about how, raising a conversation. So I'd love to have a conversation with the three of you. Uh, let me just say to the audience, let me just say to each of you how incredible your specific selection was and how much it illuminated and expand what Miss Lou has to say. You know, that white living piece is, is a piece that I used many years ago. Um, in fact, is a precursor to the passing of the domestic violence bill, which was passed in 2023. Really, so you see how Miss Lou was prophetic in bringing that home. And then Andrine, as you so aptly say, that we don't think working class or people who are marginally educated, you know, speak of love and tenderness. But love letters is one of the most eloquent, one of the sweetest rendition I know of a poem. You know, so. Um, it's it's just it's just wonderful what you've all done in sharing the breath of Louise Bennett's work with this audience who might not be familiar with it. And same with the candle. We still have candle sellers, not in the same way. But you know, again, which is why it's important for us to look at Miss Lou as a social commentator. That's what she was. That's part of what she was doing. If you want to understand the history and the culture of the in that time, Miss Lou's poems document that very clearly. I'm hearing an echo. I'm not sure where that is coming from, but I'll, I, you know, I, I leave it open for one of you to raise a question or a comment, and we can just kind of pipe in and share for the rest of the time about Miss Lou. And then I think there's going to be an opportunity for the audience to raise questions. I would. I think we have a very little uh, amount of time left and we can uh, very quickly um, ask you, Opal, to just um, e expand a little bit on what you think Miss Lou um, means to all of us. Because, I mean, for instance, I know that as a youngster, I had Miss Lou's um, voice in my head on the radio. But as I grew older and went into theater, I got a chance to perform with her. And then I studied her work at school and at university. And so this is us from that era. I'm very interested in what she means in today's Jamaica, because I see she's still very popular. And then we're going to need to um, open it up to the audience for questions. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'm doing a little documentary film with another colleague, Tommy Ricketts, on Ringding. And so we brought in some students um, to kind of reenact Ringding, which was about, it was the first show for Jamaican children celebrating themselves and their culture. And one of the little girls, and I hadn't asked her, said, Miss, I want to do this poem. And she was doing the poem Uriah Preach, right, which is another popular poem that is done in the festival. One of the things that students love about Miss Lou's poem is that she gives voice still today to some of their thinking, 
she gives voice to the characters they see in their community and they are able then to uh, share in these characters pr pronouncements. So that's a really important thing, that her work is still relevant today because children, not just from the rural area, sees these characters because, you know, these are iconic characters in the Jamaican landscape, the preacher, the can, the seller, the person on the road. And she gives them voice in a society that still does not value these people. Now, when I was going to school, we were not allowed to speak the Jamaican nation language at Woolworths. You could get a detention. And many schools did not allow for that to happen. It tells you how much things have changed since independence and particularly in the last 30 years so that now Jamaican nation language is spoken on the radio, on television. You know, everybody speaks it, even though some people pretend that they don't. So I think we definitely need to, sorry to cut you there, Opal, but I would like to ask whether anyone in our audience would like to type us um, a question before we go. I have my eye on the chat. Um, and while we're waiting for that, if, if there are any last words from Faith, and, um, well, it's 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 it's. Uh, <laughs> I agree. I'm using it. I have permission to use it. When I was growing up, that's how I was. That's how I interacted with my grandmother and my mother. And I was even telling someone the other day that I use. I I do. I make up affirmations for myself. Mm -hmm. And when my affirmations are not believable or not working, I go to the Jamaica's nation language. I was about to say Patwa, mm -hmm. but really I do. So, uh, you know, a, an affirmation might be, oh, I I am fabulous. I'm wonderful. I I respect my... No, it, that's not believable. Lift up yourself, man. You're good. You're fabulous. You can do this every day. When I do that, I'm, I'm imitating my mother's voice and my grandmother's voice. And those were the voices I heard as a baby. So it makes sense that that's where I start. It's the first language I heard, maybe after the nurse um, mm -hmm. yanking me out of my mother's womb. So mm -hmm. it's critical. It's important. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. what I want to contribute to the conversation. It's in the Q&A the Q from Dr. Fraser. Can you read it, please? Thank you, Opal, for the history of Louise Bennett and for Andrine for so vividly reading her work. You never want to call my name. Can Andrine <laughs> comment on what the poem she read means to her? Well, all I can say is that I am a lover and also an educator who has taught English as a second language to children of Caribbean heritage. And so I do understand using, using the visual medium to help students to um, access literacy through drawings. So Miss Lou was, again, like we've been sharing, that she was way ahead of her time. And uh, the questions are coming into the chat right now from the audience. Yes. Um, can you, if you see it, can you go ahead and read it, please? Yes. Um, there's a Shanice Fish. I am opening a Caribbean food market in Newark. The mission is to introduce the world to our rich Caribbean culture through food. There will be animated characters telling stories about our culture. I would love to collaborate with you oh. all on my store mission. Lord, we get work. <laughs> yeah. As Malachi Smith is asking, Malachi is one of our premier dub poets. And uh, Malachi is asking, saying, awesome presentation. Did the African-American struggles inform or impacted Miss Lou work? Take that away, Dr. Palmadisa. 
Malachi, thanks for that. Yes, I am sure it did. Miss Lou was impacted by the struggle of our Caribbean people in England, and certainly she was impacted by the struggle of African Americans and Caribbean people in America, and it informed, informed her work um, tremendously. And in, in the interview I did with her, she talked about her relationship with Maya Angelou and, you know, the way in which Maya Angelou talked about her own struggles in the South and elsewhere and her work. One of the things she loved about the news that she felt was in an affinity with hers was that he was writing about the everyday African American in us, and she was writing about the everyday Jamaica. So definitely it was informed by the African American struggle because she saw the parallels that existed in terms of Jamaica, the ordinary Jamaican struggling out of a colonial legacy. Great, great. Thank you. River Dean says, thank you for this great event. I'm working on a PhD based on Miss Lou's identification of a healing practice. I would love to discuss this with you. I don't know who you would like to discuss it with all of us or um, who wants to take that away? Well, I'm thinking we might want to offer a, a little bit more than we can cover today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that has to be something he can, if he, Take it offline. there is, at the end of this, there is a, a survey for this event. And if you fill out the survey, it asks if you are interested in learning more and, um, and you leave us your name and your email address, we will be more than willing to uh, share a little bit more with you. Uh, okay, Laurel Morrison is uh, saying, thanks to everyone for the great expressions. Must remind everyone that in my early school days, the parent would tell the teacher, you are in charge. Do what you will. Love this program, Laurel. Thank you, Laurel, Thank for you, the Laurel. reminder. And there is an anonymous <laughs> attendee who says, Alice. Can you reconnect Dr. Vangela Buchanan connection, please? Unfortunately, it I could not get her on. Um, we we have a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Faith did it earlier, but we had wanted to share. Did we share the words, Faith, that we wanted to not teach yet. the audience before? So Excellent. if you can just even just give three words, because I don't mm -hmm. want to keep us long. So mm -hmm. if you can give them three words that they might be able to take with them, and then we'll start the wrapping up of the program. Okay, well, um, I had a scenario planned, a party, a going out, uh, mm -hmm. but I'll scrap that. <laughs> uh, you already know what a guan or what guan, how are you? You already know what it's you, plural is uno. Um, uh, you all, let me see what else I can find on my list. Um, if you if your friends, whole dog, let me tell you about this one. Let's say you're going to pick up your friend to go to a party and the friends coming yeah. in and you have your pit bull running around outside. Uh, the friend needs to come to the gate and say, hold oh, dog, I come in. And that way you'll take your pit bull and put him or her inside and let your friend in. Here's something else. I'm going to show you how to use a proverb. Foul foot scratch better than cow foot. Foul foot scratch better than cow foot. When would you use that? Let's say you went to a Jamaican restaurant and you got a huge, massive, generous serving of rice and peas and chicken. And somebody gave you a teaspoon to eat the, the big lumps of luscious curry chicken. And the chicken is falling all over you, falling on the floor. What would you, what would your friend say to you? Youth man, false foot scratch better than cold foot. You need a fork. <laughs> Not if you got the context, but some tools are perfect for the task and some things don't make good tools at all. Foul foot, scratch better than cow foot. 
Ay, ay, okay. ay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. So, Angie, <laughs> Angie got in. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I need my phone. And please allow Angie to oh, introduce and give you, you the bio of all of you. Oh please, yeah. Please allow Angie to to do that, please. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Oh, wow. Oh, no. When it comes to, I'm sorry, when it comes to technical issues, right? We just never know. You so never know. I, I'm, I'm happy that I did finally have a chance to get on. I'm sorry. I pretty much missed, you know, most of this. I was so looking forward to it. Yes. I'm Dr. Vangelo Buchanan. I am also an author. I am owner of The Writery Inc., a bookstore and publishing company in Connecticut, in Bloomfield, Connecticut. I am also, uh, you know, a Miss Lou fan. I actually had a chance to meet her uh, in, in Toronto one year, you know, not too long before she passed. And that was um, before selfies and all of that. So I never took a, a, a photo and and I, I, I regretted that every moment. My sister and I had a chance to meet her. So um, as I said, I'm also an author. I, I use a pseudonym, it's Vanjie Hazel. And I have um, perhaps over 20 books out there floating somewhere. And so um, I'd like to introduce the other authors who are here tonight. Andreen Bonner, she is an educator, a playwright, and a winning author of a literacy fiction series, five nonfiction books about student resilience, uh, full-length cultural dramas on African-American and Caribbean history. And of course, her poetry has been published in several anthologies. Her latest book of poetry, or the first book of poetry, I should say, is Woman in the Wind. And she, as I said, is an educator, and she's taught in New York City for approximately 30 years. Then, of course, Dawn Forrester Price taught English literature in Kingston, and she excelled in Jamaican theater and music as a singer, a lyricist, and award-winning actor. Wow. Having emigrated to the U.S., she taught college-level English. She wrote, directed, and performed educational and religious theater and video productions, including Jamaica Woman. And we have Faith P. Nelson. She is a published poet, freelance copywriter, book developer, and indie publishing consultant. She gained years of experience working behind the scenes at the Embassy of Jamaica in Washington, D.C., and Black Entertainment Television, a Viacom network. Before that, she was an actress in Jamaica's National Pantomime and other productions. And, of course, we have Dr. Opal Palma Adisa. She's the author of numerous books. She's editor of 100 Plus Voices for Miss Lou. She has worked um, in various capacities, including in gender and writing and editing industry. She is skilled in curatorial projects, nonprofit organizations, editing, public speaking, and creative writing. And of course, she is focused, she is part of the University of the West Indies, and she received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. And her focus was ethnic studies and Caribbean literature. So these are the powerful women that we listened to this evening. And I am humbled to have joined your crowd. <laughs> we are part to be part of this, the voices speaking for Miss Lou and, um, you know, keeping her legacy alive and recognizing that she was more than an entertainer. She was a scholar. And um, I think for most of us who now speak the Patois, we understand that if it wasn't for Miss Lou, we would still be spinning around the jaw corner around the English, right? <laughs> and so we are we have to celebrate <laughs> this particular cultural icon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the opportunity. Thanks, Vanji. Too, but I 
I want to, um, be, I'm going to allow Andrine to close out with her benediction to Miss Lou, but I want to encourage her part in this to check out these ladies on LinkedIn, Facebook, yes. Instagram. They have a, a plethora of literature, both in um, nation language and in standard English. They are scholars, they are performers, they are marvelous women. And we, we couldn't do them justice in giving you their bio tonight. So I need you to look up, to check them out on your own, do your research. And I thank them and I thank you all. And I thank Centenary University for allowing us to be a part of this Black History Month with a thank twist. Thank you, thank um, you. So, and thank you, thank you, thank you, Susan. I appreciate you and Thank the work you, you've done. Susan is the library director for Centenary University, and I thank her so much for allowing us to take part in this. And with that, I will allow um, and Andrine to close out with the benediction for Miss Lou. Thank you. In the shadows of history's darkest night, Louise Bennett Coverley reminds us of our ancestral might. Survivors of the Middle Passage slavery's chains, in her words for laughter, their resilience retains. So clap her, clap her, bless our two, hot and clear, for we grill, Miss Lou. Raise Miss Low picture upon billboard in a Times Square. Our Madras national dress with John Crow beads, stylish coconut earrings and bangle she half a wear. Post squeeze Bennett verses like Billy Collins in New York City subway. Tell them like the Eiffel Tower upon our September 7th birthday. Look at power. Clap her, bless her too, cut and clear, for we grill, Miss Lou. Sing our praises loud. Join in the mystic dance, make we brock out in our brockings, et to wheel and turn to the gumbe, dinky mini, and the kumina. Let the spirit of the ancestors rise to meet her from the caverns of the silk cotton tree to the river valleys of the cockpit country, for she carried out the assignment with grace. Mech with mech nof nice in a display. So clap her, clap her, bless her too, cut and clear for we grill Miss Lou. Full of bookshelf in a every library. Put Louise next to Shakespeare, Robert Frost, Tolstoy, Zora, Neil Hurston, Audrey Lloyd, Entozaki Shange, Tony Morrison. So clap her, clap her, bless her too, cut and clear, for we grill, Miss Lou. TV stations will soon catch on. Prime time, night time, midday news, close captioning subtitles on Chirons. What a something with nation language, Miss Lou, give with the literacy keys, the literary keys, opening portals to a culture of possibilities. So clap her, clap her, bless her too, cut and clear, for we grill, Miss Lou. Thank you.